that, we'll call this meeting of uh, October 17th. Uh, to order, a roll call, please. Good evening, commissioners. Karen Kahn. Present. Kirk Martin. Here. Craig R. Curry. Here. Carl Hopkins. Here. Bruce Miller. Here. Jim Wilson. Here. Paul Bowen. Here. Thank you. Do we have any changes to the agenda? No changes to the agenda. All right. Thank you. Notices on Friday, October 12th, 2018 at 5 p.m. The Airport Commission Secretary duly posted this agenda on the bulletin board. And that brings us to public comment. Any other member of the public may address the Airport Commission on any subject within its jurisdiction. Uh, this time slot is for those not scheduled items. Do we have any uh, speaker comment slips? Yes, Chair, we have uh, what one speaker slip. Um, Joe, and I'm going to have to ask for a little help with the, the last name. Um, we have one speaker slip regarding air, airport, uh, specifically flight paths, airport policies, regulatory requirements, and any uh, relevant metrics. Okay, that sounds like a not agenda item, so we'll take that at this time. So uh, we have our speaker. If you come up and address the commission, please. Thank you. Hello. Uh, good evening. Is that too close? Okay. Um, where can the public, people like me, find the airport policies, the flight paths for commercial aircraft? Um, let's see what else is on there. Uh, I don't recall. You'll have to give it to me. There's a lot. I'm wordy, forgive me. Um, regulatory requirements and any metrics that you, s that you take. And specifically, commercial aircraft flight paths. Okay. Thank you. A lot of great questions there. Uh, those aren't things that the com commission would address in this forum, but it'd probably be best if you could contact somebody on airport staff who uh, would the best contact for uh, uh, public there. If, if she speaks with um, with Mo, Mo can provide our contact information, specifically my contact information. If you'd like to reach out, and we can we okay. we can yeah. engage in that. Yes, fair. Hello, Mo. Great. And do I just call and ask for help? Thank you. All right. And I'm sure the director could get you all sorts, probably more information than you probably care to review you know. yes. a lot a lot packed into that all right any other questions public comment that's the only speaker slip all right thank you very much and that brings us to our liaison reports and do we have our city of santa barbara liaison back there i do not see you know, uh, commissioner uh, council member dominguez but i do see our city of galita liaison the honorable michael t bennett Anything to share with us today? <laughs> All right, thank you. And it brings us to the consent calendar. Any changes to the consent calendar? No changes to the consent calendar. All right, that is then composed of the minutes and uh, waiving the reading and approving the minutes and the property management report. Do I hear a motion? I so move. Second. Second. All in favor of approving the consent calendar? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Consent calendar carries. And that brings us to our first administrative re report. The runway incursion mitigation taxiway H extension project update. So Chair Miller Commission, we've asked uh, Owen Thomas, who is our um, engineer on site, who's been leading this project for us to give a brief overview of uh, where we are in the process, where we expect to be in the future, and some alternatives that we're looking at today. Okay, good evening. Um, I'm just going to go over the alternatives for the Taxiway H extension projects here. I've been working with uh, Kimley Horn, some airport engineers, and we're uh, trying to carry forward this major project that's part of the airport master plan, which is adopted. Uh, December of last year and it was identified in the master plan with a recognition 
that the FAA's current priority is to reduce runway incursions and with an emphasis on runway incursion mitigation. So the new acronym for us is RIM. Uh, we had been focusing on safety area improvements, but system-wide those have pretty much been brought up to current standards. So now they're focusing on uh, runway incursion mitigation um, as the kind of new focus on safety projects. Uh, and to clarify, runway incursion is simply an unauthorized entry into the runway environment. So it, it sounds simple, but um, the process to really go through can be pretty complicated, expensive, and take a long time. Um, there are many different ways to reduce the chance of incursions, uh, lighting, signing, marking, and now the FAA is also focusing on making modifications to airfield geometry and to specifically reduce runway crossings. And runway crossings, particularly in the middle third of the runway, which is considered the high impact area. So they're trying to minimize those crossings. And the Taxiway H extension project um, really accomplishes two big things for us. Uh, whoops, hit the wrong button there. Our current setup, we have all the traffic on the north side of the field here. Um, the only way aircraft get to and from these aprons is via taxiway Charlie, crossing at Foxtrot, and then proceeding to the west end of the runway. So every landing and takeoff from or to the north side involves a runway crossing here. And an additional uh, you can notice it's this oblique angle that the taxiway intersects here is non-standard. The standard is a uh, 90 degree angle and uh, it's a big wide expanse of pavement and very easy for pilots to get confused there to know exactly what they're going to do. And <coughs> this is exactly what you don't want right at the entrance into that runway environment. So. Our project would uh, extend the current taxiway H, which ends right here, about 3,000 feet to the west, and then provide a new connecting taxiway here. This alternative A provides a hold apron at this location, north of the taxiway. And then, since we're eliminating this portion of taxiway C, <coughs> we're going to be providing a new connecting taxiway uh, right at this location, which is really an exit taxiway. And there really would be no crossing going on here anymore. Everything would be coming all the way down here. And this taxiway is simply an exit taxiway for anybody landing uh, 25. And we do want to maintain some kind of exiting here because um, you know, reducing the runway occupancy time is a safety factor, and so we want to be able to provide another taxiway here. So this is the preferred alternative. We've met with uh, air traffic control tower, and um, the other kind of complicating factor here is we have a glide slope. Part of the instrument landing system is located right there, right in the middle of the taxiway. That glide slope. Um, uh, transmissometer, I think they call it, which sends out the beam that they track uh, coming into the ILS system would be relocated here. And that instrument's very sensitive to uh, large chunks of metal. So there's a critical area surrounding that instrument where you can't have any metal, any big pieces of metal, while the ILS is being used. So we kind of configured this apron here so that an aircraft could hold uh, here to do run up or if they have a delay with their clearance um, and they would be outside of that uh, glide slope critical area. And you can see in the next option, everything's the same. We demo out this part of uh, Taxiway Charlie, extend the taxiway 
provide the exit taxiway in the same location. Um, but in this one, we're using the FAA's kind of preferred uh, configuration for taxiway end. This is called the bypass taxiway. You can see there's two different uh, taxiways there, one holding position, you know, and another either entering or exiting the runway. And the problem with this one is that if somebody's using the ILS system, they'd have to hold their craft right here on the taxiway. Uh, so you could not hold anybody here if they're using it. And that just complicates life for the controllers, which is not a good thing. Uh, then we also looked at some other alternatives. You know, and part of this process we're going through is looking at <coughs> impacts to the environment. And um, we're kind of just going through the exercise of, you know, how would this work? How would that work? <coughs> this is just uh, minimizing the grading. And you can see these green areas here are all wetlands. So we have some significant biological resources out here. And we're uh, looking at the different options and how they impact the resources. This one um, we don't particularly like because it doesn't have the exit taxiway and increases the runway occupancy time. So that doesn't really meet our goals. But nevertheless, we're going to carry it forward as an alternative into environmental review. And then we also have the same thing with the FAA preferred option of uh, the bypass taxiway. Um, again, no exiting taxiway there. And then our final project is, you know, not exactly the no project project, but this is the absolute minimum that we could do and still uh, eliminate this geometrical problem that we have here uh, with this oblique angled taxiway entrance. So this one, we would simply be demoing this out. We'd be demoing Foxtrot here, uh, extending taxiway H really about 800 feet, and then providing a new crossing here. So this would eliminate the problem we have here, but it would not eliminate runway crossings. We have, in this case, moved the uh, crossing location outside of that middle third. So we're no longer crossing in the high impact zone, which is good, but we're still, you know, for every landing, every takeoff that originates or terminates on the north side of the field, there's a crossing. So that's obviously not our preferred one, but they are alternatives that need to be uh, anal analyzed and reviewed as we go through the environmental review process. So that environmental review process uh, is, uh, as you'll see in the next presentation on the uh, ASIP, um, I believe our gr we're applying for a grant in the, the end of December, and then we'd be starting work probably in July or something like that, whenever we get that grant. And then the whole environmental review process would kick off. Um, that's kind of a two-year minimum process. And so I think we're scheduled to have that uh, begin in July 2019. It's about a two-year process, 2021. And then uh, we do permitting and design and starting construction in 2023. So, as I said, it sounds simple, the runway incursion thing, but the process is complicated and takes time. But I think we have a really good start here and some good options to look at. Uh, the good news from my perspective is when we looked at all these wetland areas here, um, the total number of acres of any of the options, even the absolute worst one, was much less than what we had thought when we started. So um, I think it's uh, something that we can mitigate for on airport property, um, but we have to go through the environmental review process. So that's it. Any questions?
I, I was kind of curious. So, in the no extension option, is um, is that pretty much aligned with the like option A, such that if for what for some probably undesirable reason uh, it needed to be phased, it could be done as this, and then it the continued on to yeah, absolutely. That's the same alignment. It's just. Really, the, the center line of taxiway H all the way back, you know, to this mm -hmm. end of the field. It's the same center line, so, so it nothing, would be. If that had to happen for some unforeseen reason, it wouldn't preclude, you know, or wouldn't, you know, aside from the lower part, um, it wouldn't necessitate a bunch of rework to continue the extension at a later date. Correct, yeah. yeah. Would it, if you did that in a phasing, would it uh, delay the impact report for each phase? Um, Andrew, the planner, is saying no. Interesting. Okay. Um, I had some serious concerns on our glide slope. Uh, if you go back to option A, um, so if I'm reading your, your chart correctly, aircraft have to be to the north of that dash line to be safe so that they're not affecting the glide slope? That's right, yeah. What about, are we now saying that ground will have to coordinate with tower to make sure that nobody taxis out there? That's correct. So if they make a mistake and some large aircraft is taxiing out there while somebody's on the ILS approach, conceivably our glide slope is going to be off. That's correct. But that's not unusual at other airports where you've got an ILS hold short or ILS critical yeah. area, right? Yeah, I've seen it at many other airports yeah. where there is an ILS critical area. But so our, our aircraft would either have to get out to that apron quickly and mm -hmm. then wait a long time or stay back. Or stay back here, yeah. So I'm not yeah. sure how much that apron buys us in this case. In our discussions with the air traffic controllers, and they're really the experts here, we defer to them, they strongly favored this option and felt like it would be workable and better than no apron at all. I, I can easily see uh, one plane getting, without that one plane getting out there, a hold for release, and another plane getting stuck behind them. Uh, and even with that option B or whatever it was with the parallel taxiways out at the end, that doesn't sound great. There's no way to move the ILS south, or would that just affect the... That just affects the other side. Okay. And what is the triangle of uh, different color over there uh, above and to the left of Charlie? Uh, here? Yeah, what's that? This is existing concrete apron which is shown to be the pavement would be removed there. Okay. So all this pavement here would go back to dirt. And okay. You know, this is another kind of uh, problematic location where, you know, an aircraft could be right on the ramp here and then they're right next to the, the hold short line. Yeah. So they could theoretically go from, you know, uncontrolled area onto the runway boom in one shot. Will this have any impact on any of the buildings or fuel farm or the NOAA site or any of those others because of the proximity of uh, taxiway to buildings, et cetera? I'm not positive. I don't believe so. It might affect, might have some effect on the fuel farm as far as um, uh, the size of aircraft that could maneuver and turn in here, this will be a lot tighter. Um, that uh, uppermost line, is that the edge of the, the taxiway? That one right there? This one, that's object free area. Okay, and the actual, okay. Yeah, edge of the taxiway is the dark, you know, pavement okay. kind of marked. So yeah, that you can see that object free area really pushes up there and pinches in that area by the fuel farm. Um, we looked at it from a preliminary basis and it's still accessible to small aircraft, but uh, larger aircraft could possibly be precluded from using that. 
I think it's uh, the area just to the right of what you've rendered as um, hotel there. Is that ramp or is that actually taxiway? Here? Right, if you were to extend the taxiway. Yeah, way. it really, this graphic isn't perfect. This shaded stuff should go all the way over okay, here. Okay, so that, that would be taxiway. We're kind of, we're still in progress here. Okay, but so essentially that's not the entrance of hotel there. It's really all that should just No, be it would connect yeah. seamlessly to yeah. uh, right back here, and it really connects right at the intersection yeah. with Charlie there. Right. So, yeah, certainly um, reduces <coughs> the space. I'm I'm looking at the stub alternative here and thinking and thinking that if this existed Charlie would not exist, correct? There would be no way to turn off at Charlie after landing on two five. Correct. And has anybody I mean I know I always use Charlie because I never want to jam on the brakes in order to make what is it, Mike? Mm -hmm. And so you're now getting longer times on the runway for the people behind you because you've got a taxi farther to get off if you're going to the north side, just a, a point. Was there any thought to making the stub down at, what's the next off ramp that goes to the taxiway that goes to the south, just before the end? Um, you mean in this direction? No, go, go left to the approach end of seven and come down down here? Yep, and just go back a little bit to the right, right there. What is that? I can't remember. That's an existing uh, exit taxiway November. November. Well, November, so would, you, would, would there, not that it would, it would give you another way off the runway, but I guess it's right the way of the glide slope transmitter. Yep. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just wondering if Charlie became a straight stub or an extension of and you did basically two vertical straight crossing, 90 crossings instead of just an idea. I'm, ass I'm assuming you looked at something like yeah, that. Yeah, and one of the things we're trying to really do is offset any potential crossing location here. So you don't want, no, we understand you don't want crossing, so you definitely want the extension. I was just going to say in terms of having turnoffs for aircraft landing, which isn't a runway crossing problem. They're just exiting the runway, letting them do it sooner. Um, because if I don't get off at Charlie, I'm obviously going to taxi further until whatever that new one might be called. But Yeah, this one I'm calling H1 now. It okay. really, you know, this is on the order of 800 feet or something like that. And so we, you know, kind of considered sliding it back and forth here to find kind of the optimum spot and moving it to this location um, it kind of helped for some of the faster arriving gave them a little more time to get off than here. Has anybody done a study as to how many people use the full runway length who are turning to go to the north side i.e. smaller aircraft private jets etc because of course most of the stuff unless it's going to Atlantic that turns off to the south at the end of the runway is the airline population. So we didn't, I was just wondering if there were any statistics. They got a lot of people taxiing all the way down to the end and everybody's waiting for them to clear the runway. Um, we haven't specifically studied that, but that might be something we do mm -hmm. in the, the next phase. Well, certainly with the relocation of both FBOs, Right, so you're going to get all of your turnoffs other than airline basically going to the north. So they're all looking for spaces. And I don't know, is, is there an option that keeps Charlie as a turnoff place and also keeps the next one so that you've got, although. Um, if you want the high speed offer, that's what you want. No, I have to add power to get to it. <laughs> but, but it's just a case of the, the more you've got, the more efficiently you can use the runway because people get off it sooner. Along those same lines, I was noticing <coughs> if you're landing seven, you can easily make Charlie or many times, but you can't make that new Hotel One. So under that configuration, I would guess that most people landing there would have to go all the way up to Mike. That's right. We and looked so in at both that. cases. You've got cases where people are on the runway longer. So, so with that, if, if you don't mind, Commissioner, I can speak to that a little bit as we were working through the the placement. Um, 
there's, uh, as Owen mentioned, there are a few different um, problems that the FAA is now requiring us to engineer, engineer out through our runway incursion mitigation program. One of those is the direct access to aprons. So the existing taxiway Charlie, <coughs> if left in the current configuration, would provide that direct access, which they are not funding anymore. So we are required to relocate those taxiways anytime we have a feasible option. Um, mm. And the other piece of that that I would just like to expound on a little bit was the, the placement. Knowing that the large majority of our traffic is coming in on 2-5, when they first came up with the placement of the new turnoff, that was specific to the design aircraft that we are anticipated will be using it as the FBO relocation occurs. And it's really kind of triggering the, the smaller jet traffic. Um, so I realize from the piston perspective, there's some complications. But when you start to look at the total fleet mix, that went into partial placement of that taxiway in that location. Okay. <coughs> Uh, is alternate A the uh, preferred alternate? Uh, yes, it is. Th it's our preferred al alternative at this time. Um, is there any location where large taxing airplanes will affect, affect the ILS beam? Um, yes, inside. Here's the, uh, the glide slope transmissometer is right here. So anything, see this dashed line? Anything that's taxiing in this area all the way up to here would uh, affect that glide slope signal. Okay, so that, so that if you have an airplane on final approach, you'd have to hold short of the dashed lines. That's right. You'd have to be either be sh holding short back here or you'd be in this hold apron up here. See Thank this, you. This hold apron is just outside of that uh, box, and that was really the intent of putting that up there to look at that. Are there any issues cost-wise that would be felt by the airport? I understand federal dollars are heavily involved here, um, and I'm not too aware of what our potential cost savings are for the different options to the airport. Um, we're still working on the cost for each option, but you know, in the big picture there's really not that much difference in the cost. And particularly when you look, I think, at airport share, uh, the cost differential is going to be pretty minimum. We are talking at this point of, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of a $12 million total project cost for this. So I think um, if we were to go with absolutely the cheapest option, uh, which would mean, you know, the least amount of grading and paving, et cetera, uh, that would probably save us uh, one or two million. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, comments? Okay. Excellent report. Thank yes, thank, thank you. you very much. All right, that gets us to the next exciting item, the Capital Improvement Program for fiscal years 2020 through 2024. Thank you, Commission, for that presentation. Andrew Berman. And will, uh, I will uh, point out that the uh, Budget Subcommittee <coughs> did meet for about an hour and a half uh, prior to this meeting and also received a very thorough uh, presentation on this. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair and Commission. I'll, I'll try to be uh, as thorough this time around. Um, so the purpose of this meeting, as we discussed already, is uh, to review the draft capital improvement program for uh, the start of the 2020s, and um, then for uh, Airport Commission to uh, make a recommendation that the uh, capital improvement program, or CIP for short, be forwarded to uh, the City Planning Commission. So we have uh, three masters here at the airport. We've got the local, state, and federal government. They all have inputs on to uh, what our capital program should look like. Uh, the FAA has the Airports Capital Improvement Program, or ASIP for short, which is a five-year program that uh, we submit for uh, scheduling our Airport Improvement Program, AIP, applications. So those, that's the federal funding that we use for projects like Taxiway Hotel. Uh, we also have a Caltrans Airport Capital Improvement Plan, which we submit to the state. That's a 10-year program. Uh, there's no funding associated with participation, but we participate because we're in California. 
And then uh, we have the city capital improvement program, which is mandated by uh, the city charter, and that's specifically what we're discussing today. Uh, so the city charter dictates what uh, a CIP must be. It must be a five-year uh, capital program, have a, a general summary, a list of capital improvements proposed to be undertaken during those five years, uh, cost estimates, and the annual um, cost of operating and maintaining any new assets. Uh, it's updated every two years as part of a two-year budget, so we don't do this every year. Um, it's uh, considered a planning document, but the first two years um, are at the city administrator's office has asked that those be budget ready. So you just take these items that are in your CIP for those first two years and you drop those into your uh, to your uh, two-year operating budget. Uh, the, outer the outer years are then used for uh, identifying unmet needs, needs that you can't do in that two-year budget cycle. Um, and then finally, a change from previous years is the, the last, uh, you know, instead of the outermost uh, projects being in, say, year 2025, we uh, identify those as unscheduled, uh, which is, I think, just a more accurate reflection of how that is being used by the departments. So this, uh, you know, the uh, operating budget gets approved by City Council in June. That's not very soon. So why are we discussing this now? Um, we start the process in uh, September, the year before. And then in October and November, the various boards and commissions that review uh, city departments uh, review the draft portions of the CIP as we're doing. And then um, we, uh, at, at the, we have a staff review with our city planner and city engineer. Um, and then uh, the Public Works Department assembles the entire city CIP that goes to uh, the Planning Commission and then mm. to uh, the city administrator's office as a rec you know, recommended approval version. And then that goes to uh, our city council in March. And the city charter requires that uh, the CIP be reviewed by our city council three months before adopting a budget. So it has to go in March in order for the budget to be adopted in June. And we all want that because otherwise we don't have a budget in July. So um, for the airport department's projects, uh, we have a CIP summary sheet, which is included in the, uh, the uh, airport commission memo. It's broken into two portions. The purple proportion at the top is uh, the items that are AIP eligible. Those are funded through uh, predominantly federal dollars. And then the lower portion uh, are the, uh, the local projects. And then uh, also an attachment to the uh, uh, Airport Commission memo are the uh, detail sheets for each project. Um, there's a short summary, and then uh, the capital costs uh, are in the lower portion there. So this submittal is a $60.5 million capital project list. Uh, many of them aren't proposed to be done in this five-year period. Thus, we'll have the unscheduled ones at the end. Uh, 20.2 million in uh, federal funding. Uh, that's 2 million of local match for those projects because that's a, a 9.34, just under 10% match. So it's a pretty good deal. Um, and then we also have 38.2 million in uh, projects that are identified as airport capital needs. So we'll start with the federal ones because those are the ones that have the uh, you know greatest funding opportunities available. Um, so starting for f uh, fiscal year 2020, we have um, a security system upgrade. Uh, and uh, Mr. Chair, if I could recommend that if anyone has any questions for any of these projects, that we interrupt my presentation and do those as we come through them rather than holding to the end, because I think that might get confusing. That's a great suggestion. So, uh, so feel thanks. free if you've got questions. Sorry. Uh, another item for 2020 is airline terminal apron redesign. That's an adding of a bo passenger boarding bridge at gate three, relocating some fence and restriping the, air f the, the ramp to uh, accommodate that. And then uh, the project we just heard about in the previous item, uh, taxiway hotel extension. In 2020, we would begin environmental review as discussed. 2022, we would do design and permitting. And then in 2023, we have an $11.2 million uh, grant application for construction. Um, and then in the outer years on the federal side, uh, there's in 2021, we would be looking at uh, constructing a laboratory pretreatment facility. <coughs> uh, the Goleta Sanitary District has expressed concern with some of the uh, chemicals that are coming off of uh, the uh, 
commercial airline uh, restroom facilities that um, are causing a, a, a chemical spike in their treatment as, as our carts are, are dumped into their system. And so adding a pretreatment facility so that we can uh, neutralize those chemicals or titrate them into the um, sanitary sewer system would help avoid causing problems for uh, the sanitary district. I'm sorry. So uh, the slide indicates 2021. The summary sheet has that in 2024. Y you're correct. That should be 2024. The slide. That's it. Oh, yeah, the 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 table is correct. You're right. That's a okay. Typo on the slide. So the slide should. Be Sorry about that. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. And then um, also, uh, so for federal fiscal year 2023, our fiscal year 2024, the summer of uh, of uh, 2023, we have. Um, the uh, purchasing of a new sweeper. Uh, our sweeper is old currently. It'll be older <laughs> in five years. So um, that's scheduled for that year. And then we also have uh, runway protection zone acquisition. There's a parcel that's uh, uh, zoned industrial, uh, suitable for d development generally, except for the portion that's in the runway protection zone, uh, which is in conflict with uh, FAA advisory circular for runway protection zones. Uh, FAA's guidance is that the, the you know, ultimate best use of an RPZ is in airport uh, uh, control ownership. And so uh, we would be looking at trying to acquire a portion of that property from the property owner through an AIP grant. And then uh, last in the federal projects is Goleta Slough Mouth Management. That's a, a, a pipe pump and sand grading equipment to uh, manage the water level when we have um, certain conditions where we have high water level that attract uh, migratory waterfowl. Um, as you may recall, uh, in uh, 2014 and 2013, we had um, uh, high standing water for long periods of time in the spring. And rather than having a, a dozen or two dozen geese, we had uh, 1,300. And that's a significant change that creates a very different uh, safety issue and a, a much more difficult uh, staff response to address that uh, wildlife strike hazard. So um, uh, in our wildlife hazard assessment, we identified managing the, the water level at the Goleta Slough programmatically. And we are in uh, conversations with our federal friends at the various environment, uh, environmental resource agencies to come up with a program and a permit process for, for that project. And the summary shows that in 2025, and the slide has that 2023, 2025? Should be 2025. That's correct. And I also know that the sweeper in the slide is 300,000, 250 in the summary. I think. Is that right? It's uh, probably between those. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You're going to hire you as a proofreader. <laughs> All right. So on the non-federal projects, starting off with uh, it fiscal year 2020, we have the shared use uh, passenger processing system. That's a computer system that allows for dynamic use of uh, mm -hmm. airline terminal gates rather than um, exclusive use or limited shared use of, uh, of gates, um, which allows for better utilization of our existing gates rather than uh, building more gates for airlines to occasionally use. Um, for 2020, we also have a remodel of 6190 Francis Patello Road that's in support of, of a uh, tenant it, who has a competitive process that we're trying to uh, retain. Uh, and uh, that's a 70-year-old building with some deferred maintenance on uh, roof and uh, air conditioning, heating, and ventilation systems. So um, we would address those uh, deferred maintenance needs first, and then in 2022, we would also do the, um, the facade improvements. Uh, also, as part of the airport master plan adoption, uh, one of the mi environmental mitigation measures was the uh, mothballing and restoration of uh, the General Western Aero hangars, commonly referred to as the Boneyard hangars, um, that were constructed in 1928. Um, in, uh, in 2020, we would have a $75,000 study of how we can uh, support and uh, maintain those. It's called mothballing, uh, according to uh, historic preservationists. That's making sure that uh, they're not uh, demolished by neglect. It's merely a Band-Aid to keep them in place. Um, and then in 
um, 2024, actually, um, we would, uh, so 23, 24, we would have uh, uh, three quarter of a million dollars for um, uh, their restoration and relocation. And then we have uh, the next sort of chunk of projects on the capital improvement program are uh, our uh, large scale maintenance efforts for our various assets that um, that need that. Uh, the least building maintenance would be uh, 150,000 a year for each of the years for um, mostly re-roof and HVAC projects. Uh, the street resurfacing program, each year we address a certain segment of uh, the streets that are not maintained by the City Public Works Department, those are the, uh, generally speaking, those are the roads that are named after aviators rather than uh, Hollister and Fairview. Um, we also have the Airport Operations Area Pavement Maintenance, uh, that's uh, crack seal, uh, slurry seal projects. Uh, utility infrastructure is uh, the water, sewer, lighting, uh, all of the various uh, utility connections, both to our airfield and also to our uh, physical buildings. And there's a, a continual obligation to uh, maintain or repair or replace those, especially with our high water table. Um, and we also have terminal projects. Uh, our new airline terminal has a lot less maintenance needs than the old one did, but that doesn't have none. Um, it, sort of immediate uh, concern is uh, the, the stucco crack repair. Um, the flooring, as you can see, has a, a, a cracking as well that we've had to address. And then um, we also have uh, evolving ADA needs that we need to uh, stay up to date with. And then also, uh, as you all know, the hangars at 495 South Fairview Avenue um, were reverted to airport ownership earlier this year. And uh, then that also correspondingly has a maintenance obligation. And so we've identified uh, a continual pot of money for addressing, again, a lot of it being uh, roof repair. Um, and then also in um, 2022, uh, coinciding with its neighbor, we would have a, a half million dollar update to 6150 Botello Road. Um, that would be both the the uh, roof and HVAC, as well as uh, facade updates. And then after that, we've got a long list of projects that are in this new unscheduled category. Uh, these are all projects that the airport has identified as uh, future needs, but we don't have a schedule or funding source for when we could address those in this five-year planning horizon. Uh, the first one is a continuation of the 6100 Hollister Avenue development that's uh, buildings one through five are in process now. Uh, the remaining four buildings would be uh, constructed at some future date based on the revenue generated by those. Um, but that will be uh, a while for those uh, for that pot of money to grow. Uh, terminal expansions identified in the airport master plan as a approximately 5,000 square foot need that we would have in probably a five-year timeline according to the aviation forecast. We remains to be seen whether we'll have that need. Um, that would be about $5 million to uh, add new concession <laughs> space, new hold room space, and uh, a new passenger boarding bridge. And then we also have a, a number of projects that are unscheduled but would be AIP eligible, so I've noted, noted that quickly with an asterisk here. Um, these are a series of taxiway projects that are uh, grouped based on the, uh, the similarity of uh, pavement condition. So the first one's uh, CHJNN, and then we have uh, run runway 15 right and taxiways D and J, and then uh, taxiways A, F, and P. We also have the completion of the uh, sewer master plan as an on that scheduled project. Um, that is the uh, removal of lift station three. We've removed lift stations one and two and tied those portions of the airfield into the Goleta Sanitary line in Fairview Avenue. This would do that for the uh, area in the northwest quadrant of the airfield that still drains to um, lift I station three. I thought there was something associated with this uh, directly related to uh, Taxiway Hotel. So portions of the um, of this project 
could be AIP eligible, the portion that would be under the airfield. Um, the way the taxiway is designed because of the particular design width, um, lift station 3 wouldn't have to be removed in order to uh, construct taxiway H, so it can remain, and that means that its removal is not AIP eligible. We also have the relocation of uh, this building's use, the airport administration, uh, to the mezzanine office space in 495 South Fairview Avenue. Um, that's a necessary step in order to accommodate future um, fixed space operator development on this side of the airfield. Uh, we have identified a project for uh, a new light industrial use at 81 Frederick Lopez Road up at um, Robert Keister Place. Uh, that will probably follow the completion of 6100 uh, Hollister Avenue. The, it's a very similar use, but that project's already permitted and in process, so we would want to complete that before addressing this one. Uh, here's another uh, AIP eligible, uh, potentially eligible project is uh, rehab of taxiways E, G, K, and L. Um, and then we also have the uh, Hollister Avenue drainage improvement. There's uh, wetlands on the south side of of Hollister Avenue between Arrow Camino and Los Carneros Way that um, will flood in uh, any typical uh, winter storm. Um, we've had fewer of those during this drought, but we still have had that occur. Um, and that's basically because that wetland uh, uh, pools and uh, out onto both the bike lane and uh, the uh, travel lanes on Hollister Avenue before it drains into Los, or to Carneros Creek. And so we would want to improve that drainage so that it actually flows into the creek before it starts backing up onto the roadway. Uh, also in the uh, associated with the FBO redevelopment project, if there's no longer an Atlantic on the south side of the airline terminal and we have the growth to support it, we would want to extend uh, uh, long-term parking facilities on the south side, so we'd be constructing a new long-term lot called Lot 2. Uh, also, the aircraft wash rack would need to be relocated as part of the FBO redevelopment. And uh, that was <coughs> one of my questions. That's it listed in the unscheduled, but uh, the unscheduled is out into 2025, and I believe, I hope, that the FBOs will be that the leases will have been let and development will occur prior to that? Uh, that's possible. I think it's, um, it's difficult to identify what the airport department's costs will be associated with the FBO redevelopment until we look at what the um, phasing of those projects would be. I think it's quite likely that we would see the new fixed space operators developing in phases rather than just coming in and building all their facilities all at once. So um, we struggled with some of those being uh, uh, slated as unscheduled. We don't know uh, specifically when or whether some of them will occur, um, but we wanted to include them as, I and mean, we, we didn't want to leave them off the list because we know that they're quite likely to occur. I would just like to suggest that, that um, as, as part of, if not otherwise, as part of the FBO um, leasing and, and development plan that um, this be considered. I'm not sure where that would be. I believe at one time it was planned for where the uh, NOAA site is now, but wherever it certainly needs a wash facility. In previous discussions in developing the master plan, both of the current FBOs said in, if they got the leases, they would want to develop their own wash racks for their customers, and they wouldn't want somebody who wasn't their customer um, utilizing their wash racks, which means the airport would need, as part of that process, to identify a site and the funding for a uh, wash rack. Correct, and it's also possible that the airport department would be partially paying for a, a shared use between both FBOs and non-FBO tenants. Um, and so this is kind of amorphous. We didn't want to leave it off because we know it's a future need, but it's really difficult to schedule and, and fund at this phase. 
as long as it's recognized at, for its importance, that's all that counts. Thank you. Okay. All right. And then um, previously in process but being put on hold is the airport industrial area specific plan update. Um, essentially, we have a, a limited capital budget that's being uh, focused on uh, maintenance needs. And so the uh, likelihood of redevelopment of the uh, of any of the space north of Hollister Avenue is is pretty low in the next three years or so and so this has been moved to unscheduled it may be uh, brought up within this five-year timeline but um, that's not been decided as of yet can you remind us about what was the cost of the uh, the master plan development the recent master plan I know it's probably larger than this the specific plan. It, it's more complicated because there's more steps to go through. The FAA has mm -hmm. specific definitions of things that need to be mm -hmm. um, met, and that was about uh, eight hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars for both the, the development of the uh, master plan mm -hmm. and the EIR. Mm -hmm. So that the master plan is maybe like double the amount of work of the specific plan. Is that? Uh, yes, with respect to special yeah. studies in particular, those are okay. typically your biggest costs with uh, plan development. Okay. Um, and then we also have the uh, maintenance uh, maintenance yard fuel tank. That's an underground uh, fuel tank. Uh, the city has identified a, a citywide need for all of its fuel tanks to be above ground to avoid the potential impacts of a leaking underground storage tank, which is really quite expensive and difficult and damaging to the environment. Excuse y yes. Th there's no uh, state funding for at one time there was state funding to remove back a years ago when I worked at the county there was state funding uh, to remove some of those uh, underground storage tanks. There is um, state funding for removing leaking underground storage tanks. This one does not leak. So if it gets you to a point that, where huh? it starts <laughs> causing a problem. <laughs> It becomes grant eligible, but then we can add a zero to this project. All right. Okay. And then uh, I believe, yes, the last project I have on this list is an airline equipment maintenance facility that's basically a canopy and a wash rack for the, uh, the carts at the airline terminal, which are currently are exposed to the elements and um, run off onto uh, the apron and into our storm drain system. So covering them so we can reduce... Uh, their contribution to our uh, uh, stormwater discharge is uh, in our mutual interest. Basically, both the airport and the airlines would, would benefit from that project. And so that's all of the projects that um, <coughs> uh, airport staff have identified for this five-year capital improvement program. I'll be happy to take any of your comments or questions. And then um, if you're comfortable with forwarding it to Planning Commission, please do so by vote. Thank you. Yeah, well, so as I mentioned, we spent considerably longer earlier, and I really wanted to commend airport staff for putting together such a really thorough uh, presentation of it and have put, you know, countless hours, I'm sure, into developing this. I, I did want to point out one topic that we did discuss a little bit was, as you see, one of the items in here is leased building maintenance, which is uh, $150,000 a year. And I think we really need to recognize that that's just really a drop in the bucket of what's really need f needed to address a lot of the deferred maintenance. Um, many of these 70-year-old buildings um, around uh, the airport property. So this certainly does not represent the totality of capital needs for the airport. So, right. questions? I have a question on an item that's not here, and maybe that's because it's on a current year budget. At one time, there was an item either in the capital plan or in the budget for painting of Hangar 2. Is that? I can speak to that, Chairman and Commissioner Hopkins. It is in this year's budget. We're planning to do it this fiscal year. Thank you. Did a great job of addressing everybody's question. All right. Well, thank you again for that very yeah. thorough yeah. presentation. Yeah. Um, and we do have an action to recommend that the uh, CIP be forwarded to the Planning Commission and City Council. I move to recommend passage. Second. All right. All in favor of recommending that the CIP be forwarded to the Planning Commission and City Council? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right.
forward away. Thank you. <laughs> All right, item seven, the Airport Disadvantaged Business Enterprise Program. We have a presentation. Yeah, Commission uh, Deanna Zacherson has been working with the FAA on this process on this program for for some period of time now, and sounds like um, making good progress. And she has a, an update for you. All righty, good evening, Commissioners. It's been a very uh, construction-heavy agenda this evening, and I'm just going to continue on that theme uh, just for a bit longer um, and talk about the disadvantaged business program enterprise program. Uh, through the FAA and uh, last time I spoke with you about this program I believe was in 2016 when we did a slight revision to our uh, program and now we've actually come upon um, the regular three-year cycle when we have to resubmit a program um, to the FAA so this program it applies to all federally funded construction projects so all of those projects that you saw that were grant eligible they would include a requirement for us to have um, disadvantaged business enterprise participation in those. Um, so it is required as a grant assurance. Um, it is a program that's intended to support small and minority owned construction firms that are believed to have a harder time competing uh, for sometimes pretty substantial airport construction jobs. And so it's a way for them to most often come in, most often come in as uh, subcontractors on larger contracts. Um, these firms are certified by the state of California. It's not something that we do. Um, and they're certified based on nationwide criteria for uh, owned by a woman, minority, or disabled veteran. And they have certain thresholds for how big they can be as far as their gross receipts. So if they're certified in California, they can actually um, compete for work anywhere in the United States. Oh, wait, there we go. It's not going. It doesn't want to go. And you'll hit my arrow for me. Thank you. All righty, as I mentioned before, uh, we are required to have a DBE participation plan. It's fairly well prescribed by the FAA. We're required to update it every three years. And so now we're updating our plan that would go through the fiscal year, federal fiscal year 2021. Uh, we are required to establish a new percentage goal for uh, the program, which I'll explain in a second how that, how that works. There's really a specific methodology they require us to use, um, which essentially entails defining our market area for construction, which is really um, San Luis Obispo County through Ventura County, where we conceivably attract most of our construction firms. Um, look at the, the totality of firms that um, perform certain types of jobs and then look at the proportion of those, the share of those that are actually certified as disadvantaged businesses and calculate um, what a reasonable participation rate would be. Usually there's not that many firms, frankly, that are, are certified as disadvantaged businesses even though they might actually qualify. Um, so now we're submitting this plan for um, the FAA for approval and one of the requirements, of course, is that we publicize this plan and that we publicize the goal. So besides talking about it this evening, we'll also do a little bit of advertising to let people know about it. Um, we'll always have the plan available here in the office if anybody wants to see it and post it on our website and things like that. So um, compliance, of course, this is a compliance program. That's what the FAA is very good at. And we are good at complying with this particular program. Um, the participation, as I, as I mentioned, is a percentage goal. So it's a percentage of total dollars spent on a particular project. And we're required to make good faith efforts to get participation. And actually what this means is that most contractors understand that they are bidding on a job at the airport. They really need to include disadvantaged business enterprise participation. Not required, but they understand that we have a requirement um, to uh, get this participation and so as a competitive element they provide that for us. Uh, we do have to report every year to the FAA the, per the actual dollar spent and the percentage uh, that we've achieved and we are actually subject to auditing at any time. I've never been audited here but I have been through one of these audits, audits previously. The FAA comes and camps out in your office for a week, looks at all your contracts, your payments and um, generally you want to try to good, do a good job up front so they don't feel like they need to audit you. So that's what we strive for. So our historical performance, if you look back even the last 10 years or so, historically participation has been at about one and a half to two and a half percent 
um, of, of a total contract. And actually, that's pretty typical for airports. It's, it doesn't sound like a lot, but it is actually, it, it is fairly typical. Now, the last two reporting years have been somewhat astronomical, really, because we've had uh, on one particular project, we had a prime contractor that was, an ACE, uh, was a DBE contractor. So basically all of that contract, we could count towards our participation. And even on the re, uh, reconstruction project for the runway, there were a couple of um, DBE contractors that had some significant participation. So the last two years, we had between 50 and 60 percent, which is outstanding, of course. Um, although it was, I don't want to say a fluke, but it was um, something that we can't necessarily count on happening every single time because it's a couple of firms that in this case happened to be competitive and got that business. So essentially, um, the FAA would want us to take that in consideration, but we've gone back to the FAA and it said that, well, we would be, we think it's reasonable that we will continue to have good participation and 3% would be, uh, we would feel comfortable as an achievable goal. Um, we don't count on necessarily achieving those high numbers in the future. Of course, we would certainly welcome it if it happened. So um, we're submitting that to the FAA. They've actually acknowledged that um, they're reviewing it now, and um, we're pretty hopeful that it's, it's going to be accepted by them. So any questions about that? Question. What happens if it's not accepted? Well, in theory, oh, if the plan isn't acceptable, uh, then we simply make revisions as to, as to um, you know, along the lines of what they're looking for. And they can be fairly administrative things. Um, as far as there's some appeal procedures for companies if they don't feel like they were they were adequately um, reviewed in a bid process, things like that. Um, but usually, usually it's those type of things. We just make the revisions that they ask for. How often have we? So we've been doing this for a while, every three years. Yeah, we yes, and we did this in 16 because um, there were some regulatory changes, and so the document really sort of needed to be updated. So we did sort of a midstream update in 16. So this is the first. This one is uh, good for the next um, three years. Thank you. Other questions? All right. Thank you very All much. Right. Okay. And we have no action on that one. So brings us to item eight, the new air service <coughs> at Santa Barbara Airport. Some exciting uh, things going on there. Exciting things both yesterday and tomorrow, but uh, we'll let Deanna Absolutely. Give the full presentation. All right. Thank you again, commissioners. Um, now we really are changing gears. This is not about construction at all. It's about new air service, and it's actually it's it's quite exciting. I think uh, most of you have been uh, a part of certainly in many ways the new air service that has come in. Whether you've come in for some of these inaugurals or uh, support us in other ways, and it's been a it's been a busy summer. Um, but it's been one that's been uh, absolutely fantastic. Um, we can't be happier about it. Um, so in 2018, I would say even uh, in a, just a span of a couple months in 2018, we've added three new air carriers. Pretty amazing. Um, so we added the first new air service since uh, June of 16, which is when the Dallas service um, recommenced. Um, the service that came in, uh, it really prompted us to look at some of the changes and making some changes, updating our incentive program for air carriers, which hadn't been updated since 2009. Um, and we've worked very hard, of course, to get as much uh, publicity for these new carriers as possible. We continue to do that with social media, and we've generated thousands of dollars of great advertising value, which I'm sure you've all seen. Um, the other uh, piece I should mention, even though it's not bulleted here, is the tremendous amount of work that actually went into getting them up and running. There's the announcement, and we're all great, happy um, about it, um, and then the work starts. It's the pulling of the cables. It's finding them space. Um, it's getting their signage manufactured up on, and up on the wall. It's all those things um, that right down to the day of the first arrival, you're kind of, you know, biting your nails a little bit, hoping it's all going to work. And in this case, it's all come together nicely, but it, it has taken a lot of work both on the part of airport staff and these new carriers as well. So um, so just go quickly through what we have added um, recently. The first one to add in August was Sun Country. They've been flying two times weekly to Minneapolis-St. Paul. This is a seasonal carrier, so they're um, flying through December 9th. We don't know at this point um, if they will continue to another destination. Um, instead of Minneapolis, we have been told that they are likely to continue resume the Minneapolis service in the spring. 
um, but that remains to be seen. Um, they are non-signatory carrier, which basically means that they pay a little higher rates for office space and some other things. They're a little less committed, shall we say, to, um, to the service here. Um, but nonetheless, they are leasing counter positions in the ticketing lobby. Um, they are leasing some shared office space. Uh, their ground handler, they're sharing a ground handler with another carrier, so they're sharing that office space. Um, we talked a little bit about um, some of the issues we have in the gate area with crowding and gate usage, and this actually is pretty indicative of that, where um, we have now three carriers that are using gate two, um, four carriers excuse me, four carriers, United, American, Sun Country, and then as of yesterday, Contour. So Sun Country, they're coming in twice a week. They're basically pulling a mobile gate podium out of a closet and hooking it up and um, processing it, their passengers that way because um, we just didn't have the space. So um, the incentive program for Sun Country has entailed marketing support. Um, they um, did not qualify for the more significant landing fee uh, abatement because it's just a seasonal carrier it wasn't regular service so but we are supporting with with marketing which we will always do so uh, and they are flying oh yes come share the, have their load factors been their their load factors have been a little bit soft actually um, at least in the month of September they were in the uh, a low 60s so n and they're flying with a 126 seater aircraft so um, It'd be interesting to see, we haven't heard from them one way or another how they feel about it, um, but uh, I think we probably would have liked to see a little bit higher load factors on that, but again, um, you know, it's Minneapolis, it's not really one of those destinations that we necessarily would have seen on a leakage study as showing, as having a lot of pent up demand. It's really been more of an inbound market from Minneapolis as opposed to outbound. Thank you. All right, so Frontier, uh, Frontier is flying with that big boy, it comes in three times a week, 180 passengers on an Airbus. Um, they're flying to Denver, they're competing with United on that route. It is regularly scheduled service, so you can see it out into well into 2019 that they've got it on the books. Um, they uh, very early on uh, told us that they were a committed carrier, they were coming back for the long haul, so they signed on as a signatory. Um, they are leasing ticket counter positions, and they actually do have a preferential podium at Gate 5. So um, at Gate 5, they have two uh, workstations and a podium that they actually assumed from Alaska Airlines in a little bit of a uh, podium shuffle that we had going on. That was one of the complicated things that we needed to, to do to try to get them space. Um, they are sharing office space with the ground handler that Sun Country has. So. Um, and then again, in this case, the uh, incentive program really entailed marketing support because Denver is an existing destination. Um, but one of the interesting things that we are going to be looking at over the next few months here is to see, uh, since we have data on fares um, historically with United, um, to see if we are starting to see any sort of price impact because of the competition on that route. In theory, you would see it, and so we're going to be curious to see if it does actually materialize. Because their 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 fares are very competitive, so, um, and their load factors have been in the mid 70s. And so have we noticed a change in United's load factors on the same route? You know that's a good question. Um, I, I'd have to I think I'd have to actually get back to you on that one. Denver load factors for United have always been um, uh, pretty good, really, um, but they've changed it up a little bit. They have a lot more frequencies now, but smaller aircraft. So um, I'd like to take a look at that and see how that looks. Frontier, of course, their plane you know, seats 180 passengers, so that's a lot of people to put on a, a flight to Denver. So a load factor in the mid-70s mid is probably pretty decent, actually. It would be interesting to see if they essentially robbed passengers from United or if we essentially picked up people who were going to L.A. to fly to Denver or wherever they were flying. So is it, are these additional passengers? Or is this just moving passengers from one airline to the other? If you could get those, mm -hmm. that data at some point, it would be very interesting. And we, we, we're seeing general growth, but that's a very good point. Um, I mean, ideally, we want to grow the market as a whole and yeah. not just cannibalize one to another. So, and of course, that's the reason why um, the landing fees, again, were not applicable in this case because 
um, we're already served with this destination. So, And then finally, with no further ado, Contour Airlines, which started service yesterday, um, which they have been uh, the benefactor of some really great um, publicity here locally. Um, so that's been wonderful for them. Uh, they started daily service yesterday to Oakland. They're flying an, an Embraer 135, 30 passenger aircraft, very nice aircraft. Um, and then tomorrow is their inaugural departure to Las Vegas. Um, and we were very pleased to hear yesterday from the CEO of Contour that the Vegas flights are essentially sold out. They are, they're doing great. Um, so Las Vegas was definitely low hanging fruit for somebody and they have decided to come and pick it. So it's good for them. Um, it is regularly scheduled service. Um, and they, again, they too wanted to be a signatory carrier. They're telling us they want to stay. Um, they're actually leasing a pretty, a fairly large um, office space in the Ovington Terminal, about 330 square feet. Um, they too are using a mobile gate podium because they do want to use a jet bridge. So um, again, we have uh, a limited space. Uh, and in this case, because they sort of hit all of the, uh, all of the uh, criteria here, new destinations, new carrier, Yes, they do qualify for the landing fee abatement. So um, that is something that they will be benefactors of. And that's probably to the tune of about $7,000 a month that we would be abating on the landing fees. Um, but And it's, it's a fairly small aircraft, so it's not as significant as if it was a larger aircraft. But obviously we do um, hope to see increased revenues from rental cars and concessions and those kind of things that we would benefit from. So we're pretty happy to do it. And so the load factor to Oakland, do you have a preliminary on that? Um, the load factors to Oakland, um, they're really good. Um, they're, they're not out of the park like Las Vegas. And um, a, as I understand from the carrier, they really feel that Oakland is one that they're going to have to put a little bit more um, uh, local advertising and that kind of thing. And, and the lo airport in Oakland is um, putting a, a fairly sizable um, uh, investment into marketing in the Oakland market. It was quite impressive. So. Um, they expect that one to build uh, more over time. It's more business travel as well. Um, Vegas is just, <coughs> Vegas is Vegas. So, um, you know, that's, that is really exciting for them to be able to do that do so well in such a short period of time. Uh, well, I know there's certainly a lot of people from the university that travel up to Oakland since the headquarters are up there. So, so I'd be happy to take any other questions you might have. Yes, I had a question. First sure. off, great job getting us all these airlines. Wow. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, for Contour, I know that uh, from watching our local news and from an invite to attend that they had quite a ceremony on Tuesday for the Oakland flight. Are we going to do that again for the Las Vegas? Well, there will be, um, yes, there will be a ceremony on Thursday. Um, we'll have the same balloon arch and that kind of thing. The only thing that's a little different about it is that it's a departure. So usually when we have inaugural flights that are arrivals, we'll be standing there with the Santa Barbara gift bags and all that kind of thing. So um, so that will be different. But otherwise, yeah, they, they will be there with a send-off with, I think it's cupcakes is what they're planning. So, um, so yes, there will be. Just a little bit different since it, it's a departure. Well, hopefully we'll get more good PR for them. And I would just like to comment um, that that airplane has got to be the most comfortable plane out there. Um, I'm six feet, and when sitting in the seat with my legs all the way extended, I couldn't, I couldn't reach the peop the w anything up front. Yeah, it's, uh, they're extremely comfortable with leg room like I'm not sure you get in first class on a lot of, of flights. So it's a great way to make a very short flight to wherever you're going in extreme comfort. Okay. All right. Anything, else? Anything else? All right. All right. Well, thank you for all that good news. And that brings us to the director's report. So Commission, uh, I did receive one more speaker slip and it's actually uh, specific to an item within the director's report. So beforehand, okay. I'll turn it over to Francisco Chacon. Yep. Did I pronounce that correctly? Yeah. Okay. Great. I don't know how this works. I've never been here before. Uh, we're well, the Air Force Commission. We are. are elected or chosen we or? Are appointed. appointed. Appointed by city okay. council. Uh, anyone not live in the city of Santa Barbara? Yeah. There are, oh, there are okay. several people. All right. There well, are several positions reserved for <laughs> what they call electorates. Uh, and, 
there. Okay, just just wondering because that my complaint or my statement is about the noise uh, that's being generated by all these new aircraft coming in. Uh, I, I, apparently, there's 77 percent more uh, passengers coming in here, and three new airlines coming in, and these jets are coming in low and they're coming in loud. I mean, it, you used to be able to sit in my neighbor. I live at 55240 San Vicente, which is probably the last house that the planes go over before they head into the fields and all that by Patterson. Um, it's right by the creek, Mary Ignacio, Ignacio Creek. Um, it used to be like we, we could stand out in the street and have a conversation as the planes were, were landing. There's no way you can do that now. You have to stop talking. I mean, it almost hurts your ears, it's so loud. Um, so there's, there's, you say, okay, you knew you, what you were getting into when you bought a house there. I bought it 25 years ago. And the, there's different planes coming in now. They're coming in lower and louder. As they, as they come in, you can hear the weight turbulence for about a minute or three minutes afterwards, just whistling and shutting up behind the airplanes. And you can even actually see the weight turbulence hit the ground because it's, you can see the, the trees rustle. You know, maybe a, a 45 seconds after the plane goes by, you see the trees rustle and you're going, there's no wind. Where, what, what was that? It was a weight turbulence from the plane coming through. <clears throat> so these things are coming in lower. They're coming in louder and they're coming in more often. I don't know what kind of environmental impact statements or reports you, you're required because we do get federal, federal funding, but that, that should be looked at because you're affecting an environment of people that live right here. And then the, the, the deal is we're, we're not, we don't live in the city because of the way they gerrymandered the city limit line out into the ocean and made this city limits. I mean, city property, we don't have a say, you know, a city council or whatever, we can complain, but we don't live there. We can't vote them out or whatever. So um, it's, it's, I just think you need to think about what's happening to the, the quality of life of people that live out there and are affected by all this noise. Yeah, not to say with all this, I saw the wash racks going in, uh, uh, sewer treatment stuff. That's gonna it, it, need to generate like an environmental statement type thing. So <coughs> I'm just hoping that maybe they'll take a look at that. And, and I don't know, you probably have never been in my neighborhood and sat there while all these planes are coming in. If you did, you'd say, hey, this isn't right. I mean, they're coming so low, lower than they've ever come before. <coughs> and like I say, the weight turbulence, you just hear it just shudder and close like after a minute after they come in. So, I mean, with that in mind, you don't even want to have too many coming in too quickly or they could be affected by the weight turbulence of the plane ahead of them. Um, so. I think I'm hoping that you all maybe take a, a trip out there when it's busy and try and have a conversation when these planes are coming in and, and listen to what's going on, you know, because it's, it's, it's different than what it was, it was before. In the past, we've had reports from the, um, I guess the commission, I don't know if you, how long you guys have been together, but yeah. we'd get a report, uh, they'd mail it to me uh, maybe 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And it would show all the flight patterns coming in, and it showed how it would be maybe fanned out a little bit. <laughs> well, the only uh, route that's supposed to come in is over Moore Mesa, turn to the Patterson Bridge, mm -hmm. and not even go over our attractive homes. They're coming straight down San Vicente now, and, and mm -hmm. I live right at the end of San Vicente, so I'm the last house to go over. Right. And, and I'm not the only person that, that uh, has noticed this. Yeah. Yeah. So. Okay. Well, I, I'm going to have to ask you to wind up the remarks, but um, sure. you know we we really appreciate your coming in and the input on you know and unfortunately you know the State Brown Act doesn't allow us a, as a commission to respond to non-agenda items okay. in this forum. Um, but how, how I can I tell you that you know the airport does take noise abatement very seriously. Mm -hmm. There is a uh, there are noise abatement procedures. There's a noise abatement hotline. There, I believe we still have a noise abatement committee that meets. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know. I think so. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I know we have one. There's a standing committee. I don't know how often they're, they're meeting. Um, 
but I, I would definitely suggest that you, you know, you contact somebody here at the airport, mm -hmm. um, here on staff, and, you know, that can certainly, you know, evolve into mm -hmm. an agenda item. Um, sure, and sure. Um, if there's a way to get in the no noise abatement committee, I've, I could do that. I, I think you could contact uh, uh, the Maureen, the secretary back there, and sure, and yeah, and uh, unfortunately, you know, we can't really mm -hmm. have a discussion about your your concerns, uh, okay, uh, unless it becomes an agenda. I just want to make sure you knew that there was a concern. Uh, yeah, well, and well, and all this stuff that comes in, it I mean, it, it needs yeah. to, you know, you got to consider the environment of the people you're affecting. You know, so. <laughs> all right. Well, we really appreciate your time. Yeah, it's all and and, and, and all this yeah. this budget stuff I didn't see anything on noise abatement mm -hmm. at all you know there's nothing in the, the product right. pr projects or whatever in there so okay thank you very much all right thank you all right the so director's <coughs> report <coughs> so uh, with that being said um, Kelly is leading the noise abatement program she and I are working uh, hand in hand with that I'll let her kind of address some of the noise abatement items specific to the director's report. Additionally, um, I'm going to ask her to speak about uh, some emergency planning and then we'll, we'll jump into the latter half of the report if we'd like to jump into that first, Kelly. Sure thing. Um, you'll find the information about the September complaints in the uh, commission report. We were down some complaints. Um, we've been putting forth a tremendous effort to uh, the carriers, both our previous carriers and the new carriers to get them the information about our voluntary noise abatement procedures. They are voluntary. They're not mandated. They're voluntary. Um, but we've, uh, we continue with an outreach um, notifying them of all the complaints we're receiving so they can educate the pilots to fly the preferred route. Um, we are working on uh, basically putting together all the information that we've been, all the outreach we've been doing and some ideas that we're looking at, ways to make the program better. Um, and we'll be um, gathering information on that to present to you in the near future. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, question, I noticed 53 from San Roque. And I don't recall seeing a large number in San Roque in the past, nor can I figure out who would be flying over San Roque making very much noise. Uh, it's a general aviation aircraft in that area that we get complaints on. Um, we, we contact um, aircraft owners and operators for two different reasons. If they're, one, if they're not following one of our voluntary noise abatement procedures, and two, if they're uh, flying um, beneath FAA published minimums. And in this instance, in this neighborhood, these complaints aren't generating, uh, they're not attributed to any aircraft that are violating any any of our procedures or FAA procedures. So we are getting a lot of complaints from that community, but um, very few of them, um, about 5% are complaints that are actually somebody that we can contact. And it's not all from one or two people? It's primarily one person. Thank you. Um, Kelly, I had a question. Uh, we've recently had a lot of banner tow activity. Mm -hmm. Have we picked up any noise complaints due to that? We have had a few noise complaints. Um, the, for the most part, the banner tow activity is not in our uh, airspace. Um, from what I understand, they traverse through the airspace for part of their flight, but a lot of their flight, they're not in our airspace, and they're not flying any of our voluntary noise abatement procedures. They're flying downtown, they're flying along the coastline, but not areas that we that are part of our noise abatement program. Well, and and they're flying at uh, FAA required altitude minimum altitudes. Okay, uh, as a resident under the flight path, I'd like to contradict that statement a little bit. Mm -hmm. But uh, I watched them go right over my house, and uh, I am definitely in the airspace uh, on the approach for uh, one five. So just a concern. They do get quite loud, and they they drone along slow. I'm surprised we haven't heard too many people. We don't complaining. have any banner tow operations out of the airport. Um, they're they're based yeah, they're in not airports. Here. Uh, you know, out of this area, and they they fly here and do their banner tow operations, yeah. but they're uh, not they're not landing here, departing here. Exactly. And I was curious whether or not these aircraft that pass through that aren't from Santa Barbara or to Santa Barbara are generating more noise complaints. Uh, we've had a few, but not more than a handful. Okay. Thank you, Kelly. Okay. So as I understand it, you're you're, saying you're collecting more information, and we will be having a, an agenda item on this topic in the near future? Correct. Great. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's definitely a topic of concern. Uh, and then speaking to our um, emergency response activity, we uh, hosted our annual 
tabletop exercise. It's where we, um, we bring together all the mutual aid rep responders that would respond to the airport during an emergency. Um, we exercised, um, we had an activity where we, uh, we walked through a mock scenario and um, we had a, a very well attended tabletop this year. It was a successful exercise. Um, we also had an active shooter drill on October 4th at one of our airport properties that was um, put on by uh, county emergency management, um, other local law enforcement and fire agencies, uh, Red Cross, and we had a lot of volunteers at that where they worked through a, a law enforcement based scenario and practice a, a full scale response as opposed to the tabletop exercise where we talk through it. This was physically walking through the motions. Thank you, Kelly. Um, and then just a, a few more uh, direct re report items. Um, specifically, uh, we had reported to the commission, I believe uh, two months ago, the Airport Safety Operations Specialist School that just concluded this week. We had 27 staff members here locally attend um, from you know, our property management division to the, the operations and patrol functions that, are th that the uh, course is really tailored for. So it was a great turnout by our staff, um, very, very enthusiastic. We were able to have 27 people uh, rotate through this two-day course. Additionally, it was a wonderful networking opportunity. We had 22 folks from outside facilities come in, all the way from Orange County, I believe was the furthest to the south, upwards to uh, Santa Maria, San Luis, I believe to the north. So it was a great turnout. Uh, AAAE, which is the American Association of Airport Executives, came out from uh, Alexandria, Virginia to provide the training for us. And we actually had a former lead airport certification inspector from the Northwest region. His name is Mark Taylor, if you're familiar with him. Uh, you know, a leader within the industry that came to you know, share his knowledge in Santa Barbara. So we're very thankful for him coming down and then sharing the knowledge with our airport partners, both north and south. Um, one last item that I, I think is very important for um, the financial future of the airport and a huge accomplishment from uh, both the partnership that we have with the finance department within the city of Santa Barbara and our own uh, administrative analyst here, Tom Bowlers. Um, one amazing feat that we just accomplished was the refinancing of the 2009 series airport bonds that uh, financed the terminal building. Uh, with their efforts, um, we're now going to be saving as of April 2019 $230,000 a year out of our operating fund. And that's also freed up an additional $385,000 in passenger facility charges, which nets out to be a total of $615,000 to the positive. So while we may be struggling through some of the uh, expenditures that we've seen north of Hollister with 6,100 Hollister, things of that nature. Um, there is a light at the end of this tunnel as things you know, fill up, the retail space fills up, and we can capitalize on some of these gains that uh, specifically Bob Samario and Tom Bowlers spearheaded for us. And I just want to give them um, you know, the kudos and appreciation they deserve for the setting us in the right financial direction. That, that's excellent news. Now, did they extend the term on those as well, or the same term? Same term, lower interest rate. So we're that's still going right. to be expiring in tw uh, 2039. And we actually went from 5.09% uh, uh, true interest rate to 3.47. So it was very favorable okay. for us. <coughs> So with that, any uh, questions? Uh, burning question on the electrical update for our tenants over in 495. I know they're all very anxious to hear when they'll get regular electrical power. So uh, as it stands today, we don't have the electrical inspections scheduled with SCE. They need to come out and actually run the wires into the switch gear that we replaced. Fingers crossed before the end of the month. That's what we're hoping for today, um, unless there are any updates that I haven't been privy to as, as of late. So. Uh, so hopefully by the end of the month we can we can shut down the generators and we'll be back on commercial power. That'll be a wonderful event for them and it sounds like we can put the blame on SCE for now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I have a question. I just have to ask this. Um, is that just because they're busy or did, did we... seems like we could have told them three months ago we think we're going to be ready on this date or is it just they don't listen to you until you are all set to go and then they and then you call them and they say okay we'll be out there in three weeks I mean how does that work our engineers have been dealing with this project and the way it works is um, we kind of get in their schedule we've been working with them for a long time so they've known this is coming um, they've done two inspections of the switch gear so there's some time in between and the, and the schedule is long term in between the inspections and so now the third step is for them to come back actually run the power and 
I guess the first step is to get on their schedule and uh, then for to have them run the power and, and put us into operation. And then remind, where's the power coming from? Where are they running the wires from? There's a switch gear, a uh, switch box, a, a junction box just um, near Fairview, so it's not a long stretch. It's just from the from Fairview over to the switch gear at the site. And then I just had one question relate. Can you one question related to that? Um, not so much related to the electrical project, but 495 in general. Um, how are we doing on the ramp? Are we on schedule with the ramp rehabilitation? Did that start yesterday? <laughs> it, yeah, correct. It started on uh, Monday. Um, this week is the slurry seal phase, um, par a portion of um, Northeast Hangar 2 and the South Ramp Hangar 4, uh, Northeast 4A and 4B. Uh, next week starts the ex excavation. So are we feeling cautiously optimistic about the schedule in terms of what we're Currently we on schedule, um, really just weather is the greatest factor that could delay right, in terms the of project. Rain. Correct. Right. Thank you. And of course, all this sunny weather makes me ask Mr. McKee my usual question. About <laughs> he knows what I'm going to ask. <laughs> Solar project. Um, we've been negotiating with the vendor, um, trying to right size a uh, project that'll work for the city as well as for the vendor. So we're, I got a new proposal today. Um, we're running it through the city's model um, to look at the net present value over the term of the agreement. And so we'll be looking at those figures and getting back with the vendor and see if we can come to agreement. Great. I noticed that overall our passenger count this year versus last is very good, except American. Uh, is there some particular reason they're down 20 percent? Yes, yeah, specifically we look at the, the down gauging of aircraft. We're seeing that both with United and American where they've gone from the, the narrow bodies back to the regional jets. Um, United has had some frequency increases to help offset that, whereas American strictly did the down gauge to the RJ-9 from the, uh, it would have been the A319 at that, at that point. So it was strictly the down gauging of that aircraft is, is my understanding. So o overall, still 5% increase in growth for the overall uh, market, but American down 20, I believe was the 20%. number. 20%. 20%. Are their load factors up high now? I presume they must have been low if they downsized so so the, the understanding is that they have been pretty good but just due to equipment availability things of that nature it's not yes. summer. You, you look you look at the yields it's the fall thank you you're welcome other questions on the directors nope all right well with that uh we are adjourned thank you all very much